it's a question about personal and romantic love. If one is in the surrendered state of consciousness, can they? S I've heard t teachings from ex my own experience and from just reading. With romantic love, there can be, I need you, behavioral expectations. And then there's like the selfless kind of love where there are no behavioral expectations and you still love the person. My question is, if you're in the surrendered state of consciousness, if you're, if you're completely surrendered to what is, do you still have that kind of selfless love for a specific person romantically? Or does that kind of dissolve? Or do, is it just only the universal, which is wonderful, the universal love? It's amazing. It's, <laughs> wow, you know? But can you also have that specific kind of love for okay. someone? Thank you. So the question, you're basically asking, would you then love everybody equally so there would not be one person singled out as special, as the Cause in Miracles calls it special relationship, uh, which the Cause in Miracles says, of course, it's of the ego to single one out as special. Now, if you single one out as special and you, what you see in the other is the form only and you're attached to the form, which doesn't, doesn't just mean the physical form, of course, that's an important part of it because that is part of the sexuality and all that, which is part of the attraction. But it includes, also includes the psychological form of the other, who you think that person is, their psychological makeup, how they behave and speak and act. That is also form, that's the psychological form. And there can be strong attachment to those aspects, both the physical come together with the psychological, which includes also emotions. There's an emotional link also there. And those coming, when they all come together, you fall in love. <laughs> uh, and aptly, it's called fall because it's a fall in consciousness. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's okay. If that's what you experience, then that life wants you to experience that. It's part of your learning, that fall in consciousness. Now, it's not immediately, of course, experienced as a fall, it's experienced as a high. <laughs> and only afterwards do you realize, oh, that was a fall. <laughs> and afterwards can be after a year, it can be after three months, it can be after the honeymoon, it can be soon after you move in together, uh, so, and then the suffering starts. What before was the love now becomes the suffering. And then for a while it can happen that you fluctuate for the next year or two or three between still feeling the love and, and the suffering. And then usually it comes to an end after a while. Or you, you compromise and uh, for some other reason stay together. So that's the, now if you are able to feel in the other, well, first of all, in yourself, that which is beyond form, the essence, the stillness, the presence, whatever we want to call it, and by, by sensing it in yourself and being it, then you recognize it in another. And that recognition, that in, this, in the space of stillness, is true love, which doesn't need the other, because the other only reflects to you who you are. But even there it can happen that the form of the other, because you are not just the formless, temporarily, you are also the form. Temporarily, you are either a man or a woman. Temporarily, you have this body. And this form, this man or this woman and this body, 
and the emotional field may find a certain resonance with on different levels, be it sexual, emotional, psychological levels, a certain resonance with the other form. And that resonance, that is what in the unenlightened romantic love makes up the entire relationship. But now when you are, when you know who you are in your essence, all those factors are still there, but they do not make up the entire relationship beyond the resonance between the sexual or emotional or physical resonance, there is a deeper level present. So you can go through the motions of romantic love with the transcendent level also present in yourself and recognizing it in the other. So romantic love may, after a while, of course, for the relationship to be truly deep in any relationship, some transcendent element has to be there because it never, it's not going to last otherwise. It doesn't mean necessarily that people need to be totally awake already, totally awake uh, knowing who they are, but some element of the formless must be there eventually in the relationship for the relationship to survive and be a true relationship. Otherwise, all you have left in the relationship is your judgments about the other and physical attraction and just mind, emotional. And that's ultimately it's not enough. It's not enough. The added element, the transcendent element needs to be there. And if the transcendent is there, you can be quite content even without the romantic relationship. You no longer say, I need that. I'm, it's when it's there, it's beautiful, but you don't need that. Yeah, pull. So the, the mind, it is often in relationships, the mind prevents the deeper level, the transcendent level from arising in the relationship. So the mind destroys the relationship, identification with the story in the mind, which you is about yourself and the other, obscures love. It might even say, love? Well, it's no such thing as love. I read a lovely, uh, in a, a novel last year um, by a British writer, it does um, Mac Ewan, He's a well-known contemporary writer, Ian McEwan, <laughs> and he wrote this book about, it's called On Cecil Beach. It's about two young people falling in love in England in the 50s. And these two young people, they feel this, the pull towards each other and they fall, begin to fall in love. And, but sexually, they are completely repressed and un, very fearful about. They haven't. It's in the 50s, so the sex, sex revolution hasn't happened yet about sex. <laughs> so they're but they're both extremely fearful about sex. And then they they get married, and their first night they stay in a bed and breakfast on on near Chesil Beach in the south of England, and they're they're trying to have sex for the first time, and it's a disaster. Dread, <laughs> dreadful disaster, and and she she is so shocked. She runs out of the room to the beach. Oh, they don't realize it's actually quite funny. <laughs> I don't explain what disaster. You can probably imagine it. And the so she runs out, and the next day, so they don't see each other that night. That's their honeymoon, their their wedding night. <laughs> And the next day, he tries. He, he goes to the beach, Jessica Beach, and she sees she's walking on the beach. They, they start talking to each other. And both feel still, the pull is still there. But both their minds are bringing up stories why it's no longer, why it's not possible, it's dreadful. They are projecting things onto the other, what she's. And so the, the pull is there, but they all, they both create stories in their minds that cuts them off from the other. And they separate. And then they spend the rest of their lives doing other things. And the rest of their lives in the novel is, is compressed to 
five or six pages. <laughs> and that shows how, the, how destructive the mind can be of true relationship. How, how the mind imposes interpretations on the other that are total fictions. But there's so much, as Don Miguel Ruiz would say, there's so much faith in these fictions that they, this, it's an the impossibility for the human being to see what the mind is creating is a fictitious judgment on that, that creates a bar barrier between yourself and the other. This writer is not spiritual at all. He just observed human nature and he, he presented it. And, and that is the ultimate lesson is spiritual. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.